Hi, everybody. My name is Cody Christensen, not Dr. Cynthia Myersberg, as it says here on my uh, Zoom screen. This is the amazing Dr. Cynthia Myersberg. Very excited to be here. This is our third HESA Professor Spotlight series. Um, Dr. Cynthia Myersberg will be talking, well, excuse me, HESA Award winner, Dr. Cynthia Myersberg, will be speaking about past life memory phenomena. I cannot wait to hear it, so I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you for having me today. So I'm going to be telling you about research that I did when I was a graduate student here at Harvard, uh, and I'm so excited to share it with you. So a lot of times when we think about memory, we think about it almost like it'd be, a, I don't know, it's like a movie playing back. That's what our subjective experience is like. But that's not actually how our brains store memories. So it's much more like we store little pieces and we put it together and our brain fills in the missing bits. And this may sound a little bit dismaying, but uh, it actually is a very flexible system that allows us to store a lot more information and also to think perspectively about the future in a way we otherwise probably could not. So it's a very adaptive and wonderful system, but it leaves us vulnerable to certain kinds of errors. And that includes remembering things that didn't actually happen. So uh, one example of this is well established is it's possible to get people to remember being lost at a shopping mall when they were children. Uh, you can get adult participants uh, to remember this, uh, about one in four people have this happen to them when they when they do this sort of a study. Uh, another one that was done was to have people remember spilling a bowl of punch at a wedding as a child. Once again, about one in four people you can get to remember this. And it becomes even more striking if you ask people to imagine it. So you don't just cue them that it's happened. Do you remember it? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I think that happened. If you have them uh, think about it, that we get this imagination inflation effect where they become even more, the, the rates can become even higher. Now like, okay, well, maybe they really did do those things, even though that's what the researcher made up. So it's also impossible to remember things that are just flat out impossible. So for instance, shaking Bugs, Bunny hand, Bugs Bunny's hand while you're at a Disney resort. So featuring impossible events and autobiographical advertising uh, can cause people to believe that they had experienced the events. So for example, 16% of people uh, claim that they shook hands with bugs after uh, receiving a false Bugs Bunny ad reminding them that this happened to them as children. Of course, we all know that didn't happen because Bugs Bunny is a Warner Brothers character, right? You're never going to see Bugs Bunny at, uh, at Disney. So... Why is this interesting? So it turns out that, and it's strange that this is ongoing, but it is, uh, that there's been controversy about recovered memories. And some, re some recovered memories are likely true, but most are likely not. And this resulted in the memory wars, the ground zero of which is more or less where I'm sitting here in Cambridge, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. So on one end, you had people saying that to ever question the memory of someone who had survived, I mean, it all comes down to bad things happening when people were kids, right? So uh, there were people who said, well, if you even question whether or not a recovered memory, so recovered memory is a memory that someone didn't have access to for some period of time. So they, they didn't remember it and now they do remember it. Versus most memories of, uh, of abuse, they're what we call continuous memories. You ask people about it, they say, oh, I wish I could forget it for even five minutes, right? So most people, it's intrusive if, if, they're, if they're having symptoms or it's something that they're aware of. The question is, what about these so-called recovered memories, like of satanic ritual abuse, or in some cases, things that are really questionable? It's really hard to say what did or didn't happen 25 years ago in the creepy neighbor's garage, right? Like, that's a hard question. And I will, I will not be going to any graphic yuckiness. So anybody who's, who's a little sensitive there, don't worry. Um, but on one side, you had uh, therapists who were saying, well, if we even question these memories, we're anti-victim. And on the other side, we have researchers who say, well, there are people remembering things that aren't actually possible. And when you're trying to make decisions about who to have relationships within your family or let your kids be around, it's really important to get things right, right? You don't want to label someone as an abuser who isn't an abuser. But you also don't want to, you know, it's a really hard position. So uh, in order to address this question, some of the people in the lab where I ended up being, I was in Professor McNally's lab. When I first arrived at graduate school, I thought I'd be doing different sorts of research, but I really became interested in this issue. So the year I was a uh, first year graduate student, Susan Clancy was a postdoctoral fellow. She'd 
just finished her PhD. And she did some interesting work looking at elevated false memory propensity among people who had recovered but not continuous memories of childhood sexual abuse. So people who said, well, I couldn't remember it for 20 years, but now I remember it, right? Um, and also similarly among people who had been abducted by, who thought that they had memories of being abducted by space aliens. They also had this elevated false memory propensity on a lab task. If you're wondering how I measure that, hang on, I'll get there. So I thought her work was really interesting, but I said, hey, Sue, all of the people in your past life, uh, pardon me, in your uh, space abduction group, they all seem to have a couple things in common. One is that they have classic trauma memories. So these are people who are recovering memories of space aliens, uh, sexually assaulting them, doing intrusive medical experiments on them, things that would be the classic sense of trauma. And I mean trauma in the psychological specific term, not the way we use it in, in common language. In common language, we use trauma to mean things that are distressing. In psychology, we mean something a bit more than that. We mean something that's not only distressing, but it's, it's that life or death cascade of hormones where you think like someone's about to cut your arm off, rape you, kill you, do it to the person next to you, that cascade of trauma. There's a, there's a cascade of stress uh, hormones and changes in the brain, things that happen when that happens. And we specifically mean that when we say trauma, right? We mean a life or death kind of situation, not just something that's genuinely deeply distressing. So for instance, in psychology, um, your loved one passing away after being in hospice for a period of months while you sit and hold that person's hand is very, very distressing and sad, but it doesn't, it's not a trauma doesn't mean it isn't terribly distressing and sad, but this is a specific scientific term. Is everyone with me there? Because otherwise I think people say I'm saying things uh, aren't upsetting when they are clearly very upsetting. <laughs> okay, so it's hard. I'm used to giving this uh, information to people who are a psychology audience and, and maybe know all these things already. So I, I wanna make sure I get my terms. So if there's anything that I'm not explaining clearly, put it up in chat and uh, Cody, can you, or can someone or, Someone will, will keep an eye and tell me if I need yeah, to explain something. Danielle, would you let me know so I can Absolutely. answer? Great, okay. So what she studied were people who thought they'd recovered memories of being abducted by, by space aliens. Well, if you actually know something about childhood sexual abuse, and again, not gonna be graphic here, but, um, but most of the time it's prepubescent children that we're talking about not necessarily all the time, but often you're talking about prepubescent children and we're talking about fondling or someone exposing themselves to someone. So it's, it's yucky. I didn't like that. I don't like being around that person that made me uncomfortable, but that they don't, it doesn't, isn't necessarily um, traumatic in the sense of that cascade of terror hormones. It's unpleasant. It's unwelcome. It's not okay. Please don't say I said that it's not a terrible thing. It is a terrible thing and should never happen. But most of what we're talking about, the vast majority of cases, by no means all, are more those sort of very distressing, but not traumatic, technically, memories. So something different is going on. So I said, hey, all of your people in the, in the space group, Sue, they all have trauma memories, but most of the people in, in the, uh, who have a CSA, that's not it's distressing, but it's not that. And she said, you're absolutely right. I said, and the other thing is that all the people in your group have had sleep paralysis. So a dyssynchrony in sleep, it sounds like, or at least they're describing something that sounds like it, uh, where they're having hypnopompic or hypnagogic hallucinations. So that means that uh, hypnopompic or hypnagogic hallucinations are hallucinations as you're waking up or falling asleep. It's really just a dyssynchrony in sleep where you're, you're more or less dreaming with your eyes open for a few moments. And they're having sleep paralysis, which if you've ever had it, you will know what I'm talking about, but it's possible when you're sleeping to briefly wake up and you can't move. Now you might say, well, what, what's going on with that? Evolutionarily, uh, you can imagine that if when we were dreaming that we're flying, we ran out into the world and tried to fly, we would be, we could break our legs. We could get killed. Bad things could happen, right? So when we're dreaming, we're briefly paralyzed. It's like our brain sends out a little message. Okay, ignore all the signals right now, just dreaming. And then when you wake up, there's a little message that, said, that goes, hey, she's awake, he's awake, they're awake, go ahead. You know, the, the person's in control again. 
but that doesn't happen in a case of sleep paralysis. So sleep paralysis, the person wakes up, maybe it's for a few seconds, certainly like maybe 15 seconds or something. They fall back asleep and they wake up and everything's fine. It actually happened to me once I was in college and I thought I had the world's most vivid dream about what it would be like to be paralyzed. It wasn't actually until I was uh, doing graduate work in psychology and I read about it that I realized what had happened to me. So it's a really weird experience, but it's not dangerous. It's no more pathological than a case of the hiccups. It's not dangerous in any way. It's just unpleasant, but it can come with some weird bodily sensations. Now, if you think that you need, if you think, wow, I've got missing time, you know, and this weird set of sensations, all of us want our lives to make sense. I, I always say that I think there'd be a lot fewer people who think they're abducted by space aliens or, or experiencers is the term that the community per prefers. So I think I'll go ahead and use that if that's okay with you all. If you know what I'm, I'm talking about, I want to be clear. And, the, and I think there'd be a lot fewer experiencers if we in fourth grade health class just taught people hey, there's this thing called sleep paralysis and it runs in families and it's more likely to happen when your sleep's dysregulated and when you, you know, when pulling all nighters, that kind of thing. So, but, but people don't know and we all want to make sense of our lives. Anyhow, so I said, Sue, what if instead of, uh, you know, doing research on people who think they've been abducted by space aliens, you looked at a group that was, you know, that didn't necessarily have the sleep paralysis and hypnopompic hallucinations and, um, you know, didn't and had didn't necessarily have exclusively trauma memories. And she said, you know, you're right, that'd be really useful. I said, yeah. I said, what about people think they've recovered memories of past lives? And she said, that's a great idea. You do it. But but I don't want to step on your toes. She said, no, 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 no. I'm experiencers, you're past lifers. So that's how I ended up figuring out what I was going to do in graduate school. So sometimes people ask me, hey, does this mean that you think reincarnation does or doesn't happen? I will tell you, my research doesn't speak. That's a metaphysical question. I have no data that speaks to whether or not reincarnation happens. And I don't want to take on, don't say Dr. Myersberg took on reincarnation. I don't know. I'm not a believer, but I don't think it's any more unreasonable than any other worldview, a lot more reasonable than some others. But the research I do does not speak to things that are metaphysical. So uh, you should know that reincarnation is a very common world belief, uh, belief in many world religions in Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Jainism, Druze beliefs, traditional Inuit beliefs. There are other ones as well. Those are just some examples. Um, I, I don't want to take on religion, but I do want to take on people thinking they've recovered memories from past lives. So are we clear that I'm making a distinction between the two? All right. So in all of these faiths, it's a, you know, well, hold on. In all of these faiths, it's accepted that reincarnation happens, but it's not accepted that an average Jane or Joe might be able to recover memories from a past life. That's a special thing. So part of what set the Buddha apart as being very special was being able to recover the memories of all of his past lives in a night. That's amazing, right? So that was not considered a normal event. Um, so let me keep going here. All right. But even though uh, belief in reincarnation is not necessarily an accepted mode of causation for, uh, for North America, it is something we're familiar with as a construct. So um, maybe you've heard, you know, maybe you've seen the best-selling book, Many Lives, Many Masters. There are several others, maybe various movies like Dead Again, uh, their TV shows like Altered Carbon and Drop Dead Diva. And you could even make the argument that Link from uh, the Zelda yeah. video games, that's reincarnation, right? So whether or not we accept it as a mode of causation, it's certainly a narrative we're familiar with. So I decided I would recruit people who thought they'd recovered memories from one or more past lives. And to be clear, science does not have, to my understanding, memories are stored in a brain. And science does not have a mechanism how the memory stored in one brain could manifest in another. So uh, whereas I'm not taking on reincarnation, I do think that past life memory is highly improbable, okay? So how did I recruit participants? I got referrals from area hypnotists who were kind enough to say, you know, I have participants or no, clients. I have clients who ask me for this and I don't know if these are metaphorical or real, but I'm happy to help you try to figure that out or figure out what's going on. 
sure, I'll be happy to pass your information to my clients. Uh, I also recruited on Craigslist and I got referrals from participants. That's called snowball sampling, if you want the fancy term. But if I had participants, I was like, well, if you know anybody you think would be interested, feel, feel free to share my information. So what did I mean when I said a past life memory? So I would screen participants. I'd speak with them on the phone. So do you have any memories that you believe are from a past life? So knowledge wasn't sufficient. So I had one person who wanted to participate. He said, well, my psychic told me about this and I believe her. I'm sure she's right. I'm like, okay, do you have any memories of it? Well, no, but I believe her. I'm like, oof, I can't, <laughs> I can't, it doesn't count. You've got to have what you believe to be as a memory. And then I asked people how sure they were. And people really vary on this and they vary on different days. So whereas when I screened people, they might've said a five, they might've come in and then said a four. They might've said an eight and then come in and said a 10. Uh, I think if you, for those of you who uh, maybe have, sometimes that's surprising to people, but if you think about it, you know, somebody asks you on one day, do you believe in God? You know, whether or not you say, I definitely believe, or maybe I sort of believe, or I, I don't know. People can vary. One person can vary, and it's the same way for this as well. So think about it that way. Or are you an atheist? Are you, you know, are you an atheist some days and agnostic others? You know, you might, you might have some variety in how you believe. And the same is true for my participants. So let's see. So for my first study, for my first study, I'll try that with syllables. I had 30 participants. 15 were reporting what they believed to be past life memories and 15 were control participants. And I very carefully matched the, the matched my participants uh, demographically. So uh, this is just up here more or less to, to tell you I'm comparing apples to apples. So I had 13 women and two men that was the same in past life memory and control groups. Interestingly, uh, if you look in North America, a belief in what are new age beliefs, which I think you could argue that belief in past life memory would fall into about three quarters of the people who believe, not that three quarters of, of women believe, but three quarters of the people who do believe are women. And this is more or less reflected in my research as we go through, this is, this is similar. So the gender divide's not very surprising. Uh, ethnically, I had 13 white, one African-American and one South Asian participant. And it was the same in my past life memory group and my control group, average age, 43 versus 42. And you look at standard deviations, they're very similar. Um, and if you look at the education, once again, 16 years is a bachelor's degree. So once again, the groups are very, very similar. I wanted to make sure that uh, I had as little noise as possible in my data because uh, it was already going to be a tough to recruit group. And I wanted to make sure that I wasn't missing, missing an effect if it were there. Okay. So how do we measure past life? Uh, pardon me. How do we measure false memory? So uh, arguably the best paradigm is the Dees Rodiger McDermott paradigm. And here's how it works. So you read people a list of words and we doing okay on time? We are, right? So do you guys wanna try it just for fun? Yeah. Okay, grab a piece of paper or you can just type it into chat and don't hit send until we're all done though, okay? So, what I will do is I will actually stop sharing my slides for just a minute. And I'm going to let you do this. Okay. You guys can't see this, can you? I can't hear them either. Can they? Probably, nope. Probably nope. Uh, Wondering if I see anything. Thank you. Thank Great. You. Okay. Great. So you, are you seeing my slides or not seeing my slides? Because I do not. You do not, slides. correct? Yep. Great. Because I don't want to spoil the fun. Okay. But now it'd be nice if I saw my slides. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a list of words to you. Just listen when I read them to you. What I want you to do is I want you to pay close attention to the words that I read to you. When I'm done reading them to you, I'm going to ask you to write down all of the words that you remember, but only words which you remember. Clear on what the directions are? Listen, don't write while I'm talking. Listen to the words. As soon as I'm done, I'll tell you to go ahead and start writing down the ones that you remember, but only, don't guess, only write the ones you're sure you heard. Okay. Ready? Bed. Rest. Awake. Tired. Dream. Wake. 
snooze, blanket, doze, slumber, snore, nap, peace, yawn, drowsy. Okay, go ahead and write down all the words you remember hearing, but only those words you're sure you heard. Do you want us to put them in the chat or? You don't have to. I just want to make sure you had a chance to finish. I was looking at the, the chat while we were going. So I'm going to go ahead and reshare my screen. Give me one second. Actually, I'll just explain it and then I'll share it. So all of these words, so you have people listen to a series of these and you time out and you do recordings. So it's all pre-recorded. What you do is you have people listen to a series of lists and do exactly what you just did. Each of those lists have a word that each word on that list is related to that's not actually presented. Can anyone guess what the word is that wasn't there that seemed like it was there? Sleep. Yes. Yes. Sleep. Sleep. So, uh, and I, I'm willing to bet all of us have some vulnerability to false memory. Uh, it happens to all of us. About one in four people, I think, on that particular list. Different lists have different strengths. Um, I've seen Professor McNally <laughs> select the critical lore too. So this can be recognition or recall. We just did a recall task. Recognition would be if I gave you a list and had you circle them after. And so what we consider to be true uh, recall is writing down the words that really were there, like wake, right? That one was on there or snooze, that one was on there. Those are the ones we would call true, true recall. But then those critical lures those are, are measures of uh, false memory propensity. And we all get some of them. But the question I had is, on an average, are the groups different? Are the people who think they're recovering past life memories, do they have more of a propensity in a significant way uh, relative to the people who don't think that they have memories of, of past lives? So let me pull my slides back up for you. My one real complaint with teaching on Zoom is that it won't let me have them already, um, have my slides already in slideshow before I, before I go to sharing my screen. You need to um, yeah, swap the display again. Yeah, I see it. It's doing the thing. Okay. Well, the good news is, you know, I don't have any notes. I'm just like so doing this in memory, but uh, try let's do the thing again. We did this. Thank you for fixing it. Of course, I think we did this. That is what we did. And then we went back. All right. Thank you for helping me. To do. Right, maybe not. It'll do the same thing, but maybe this time it'll give us the prompt. Okay, let's see. Oh, presenter, main presenter, no. Hey, Cody, try hitting swap displays instead of doing it from the. Um... Oh, you got it. Yep. That Thank works. you. Is that Danielle? That Danielle is, is our director of technology at HESDA, and that is why she's the director of technology. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so that word, sleep. 
but it's more fun to do it that way, isn't it? Where you got to do the task. All right. So my research question is, so do individuals with past life memory have elevated false memory propensity? And maybe you won't be surprised when I, well, I'm gonna show you first their true recall. So this is the percentage of the actual words, the words like wake that were, that were there. And I recognize that everyone's had statistics. I'm just gonna explain this, like I'm gonna give you a 30 second explanation so you can read the stats the rest of the way through. Our, well, the p-value needs to be 0.05 or less for there to be a statistically significant difference. And that is really just a best estimate. And this is a, sort of a quick and dirty, but this will at least help you get through it. Uh, p-value tells you how likely it is that there really is a difference. So you want those to be teeny tiny, small, small, small. And if it's not 0.05 or smaller, it's just not publishable. And uh, but you can say it's a trend if it's point, point uh, I think it's point 0.1 or, or, or smaller. And R values, you can have Rs, in this case it's Rs, sometimes it's Ds, but those are effect sizes. So that tells you how big those differences are. So in this case, that's a small effect size and a very big P. So there's no statistically no difference between these groups. And if you look at these two, uh, these two groups, they don't look very different, do they? That's because they're not. So in terms of, of true recall, the groups don't look different. But what about remembering those words like sleep that weren't really there? Very different story. All right. So my participants in the past life memory group uh, are significantly more likely to endorse or write down words uh, that weren't there. And then on the recognition task, which is instead of having to, uh, to just remember them and write them down, but circle them correctly. So again, on true recognition for circling the words that they actually did see, those words like snooze, the groups are indistinguishable. But if you look at them on for the critical lures, again, and that's a, that's a large effect size. That's uh, really striking. So uh, this does, so there are a couple of ways you could read this. So you could say that if I did a really good job of recruiting and I really recruited who I thought I recruited, which I think I did, um, you could say that, that this does support the DRM as a measure of false memory propensity. Or you could, think, you could think about it this way. You could say that people with past life memory exhibit increased vulnerability to form false memories, but no deficit for forming true memories. And that's what I think is actually the better way to think about this, although you perfectly reasonable to say either. So I also, uh, a lot of times we put an emphasis on, on quantitative data, which is wonderful. And I love, I love a behavioral measure more than anything else. But the truth of the matter is, you want to get qualitative as well as quantitative data if you're trying to understand a new phenomenon or phenomenon that's not well understood, because otherwise you just don't know what assumptions you're making and where you're wrong. This tells you what to ask next, and it also tells you sometimes where you've made mistakes. So I did a semi-structured interview to include questions like, on a scale of one to 10, with one being not at all sure and 10 being completely certain, how certain are you that the memory or memories you've recovered are from a past life that you yourself actually experienced? And I asked questions like, why do some people recover memories of past lives while others do not? What do you think? And a bunch of other questions. And the one I would always end on is, and it was beside a list, <laughs> uh, it did take about an hour and a half for most participants, some longer, some shorter. Um, but if you could do it all over again, would you choose to recover these memories? So in that first study, the mean number of past lives was 4.4, .4, and the range was 1 to 20. Here's something that's pretty neat. So uh, the mean for vividness was 8.7 and the mean for certainty was 8.2. And they were really strongly positively correlated. So the more vivid that memory experience was, the more likely people were sure that it was an actual memory from a past life. And that's to me really telling. So. One question I get all the time, and I'm just going to roll this out because otherwise it can be distracting, I think, is do they all think that they were Joan of Arc? I mean, that's actually a question I got <laughs> when I was first presenting these data. So the answer is no, they do not all think they were uh, Joan of Arc. And I'm just going to run through some of who people thought they were so you get a, an idea of what the, what the subjective experience is like from a participant. So I had some who thought they'd been Native Americans. Uh, I had a couple who thought they'd been in Atlantis. I had uh, someone who thought he'd been a medieval knight. I had uh, people who thought they'd lived in ancient Egypt. One person thought uh, she'd been a scribe. 
I had someone who thought she'd been a Druid. I had someone else who thought she'd been a member of the Scottish Royal family, but no one famous, but just a member of the extended family. But the most common one I got was actually Holocaust victim. Certainly not being Joan of Arc. Um, I had a participant who believed herself to have drowned uh, on a slave ship uh, during North American, you know, the slave trade. Um, I had a participant who thought she'd been a, a paper boy in Back Bay, Boston. I had someone who thought she'd lived in a mud hut and been a, a serf uh, during the Middle Ages. I had someone who thought she'd been a garment worker in, uh, in New York back in the day. I had one person who thought she'd been her own grandmother. And uh, one of my favorites is I had one participant who was pretty sure she'd been a polar bear. So there's a wide variety. Uh, and it was, it was really interesting. I wasn't expecting this, uh, this much variety and it was really interesting. And I'm, that this gets, I think, some pretty good themes of what, what we saw. So my real blind spot when I recruited is that I assumed my participants were gonna be very much like Sue's. All of her participants, had had something along the lines of hypnosis or hypnosis-like experience to recover their memories. So I assumed that would be true for my past life memory participants also. I mean, I'd read Out on a Limb by Shirley MacLaine. I had a set of expectations based on that. I'd read Brian Weiss's uh, Many Lives, Many Masters. But, <coughs> excuse me, but it turns out that was only about half of my participants who initially recovered memories that way, a little under, I think. So I understand the first study, I'm talking here about everybody I, I saw. So I had two more studies. So overall, I interviewed uh, 50, I think maybe 55 people about their past life memories or what they, they interpreted to be past life memories. I have a different interpretation than they did, but, um, but that was their sincere interpretation. So some people, it was flashback experiences or deja vu experiences, energy shifting, meditation, visualization, out-of-body experiences, unusual physical sensations, which unusual physical sensations was really surprising and interesting. If we have time at the end, uh, if somebody asked me about that, I've, I've got an interesting story about that. Uh, Near-death experience, shamanistic ceremony, uh, healing circles, symbol contemplation. One person, it was using a Ouija board, daydreaming, twilight dreams, sort of something between sleeping and awake, notions, reg regular dreams, um, holotropic breath work, which can cause hallucination if you learn a little bit about it, um, myofascial release massage, a trance-like uh, state experience as a child. I, remember, I think it might have been two participants who had that, but at least one. And then Hypnosis was a very common one, but it was by no means uh, all of them. And then one person, it was meditating about uh, information received from a psychic. So, and that was with recovering what the person believed to be memories of it, not just knowledge. So, <clears throat> sorry, I'm trying to let someone in. There we go. What this told me was that I recruited in a very biased way because I. I purposely recruited from people who were hypnotherapists and that was a significant number of my participants. And despite recruiting in that way, uh, that was not the overwhelming majority of my participants. So that taught me something uh, with that first, very first study I did that I needed to have a more, uh, more questioning in my assumptions. So I had some assumptions about how people got there. They didn't all get there the way I thought they got there. So, oh. I haven't said it. So my next question was about imaginative experience. It seemed to me that having a past life memory might be a really imaginative way to deal with uh, existential questions we all face. And it's to me that if someone had a rich imaginative ability, it would be very difficult to uh, think about that correlation between vividness and sureness. It seemed to me that if someone had a very rich imaginative experience, if you can see it, hear it, smell it, touch it, taste it in your imagination, well then it would seem to me that it'd be much more difficult to distinguish the memory of a perception from the memory of something that's an imagination, right? 
So absorption is rich imaginative ability. So if that were the case, then my participants should report uh, being higher in absorption. Uh, so let's see if that was the case. So indeed, uh, people who reported recovering memories from one or more past lives, quite high uh, relative to control participants on a measure, on a self-report measure of absorption. So imaginative ability. I was also interested in something called magical ideation. So magical ideation is being willing to consider unusual modes of causation as causing something. Uh, so for instance, sometimes this means seeing connections where they aren't there. Uh, if you go in a court of law and you say, well, you know, how did the murder weapon get in, uh, in my car? Well, someone moved it there using telekinesis. We're probably not going to accept that, right? We might be familiar with it as an idea, but we're, we don't accept it as a, as a culture, as a way that things actually happen. Uh, ESP is another example of this. There's several things that are along these lines where we're familiar with it as a, as a construct, but if you, if you don't believe it's even possible, you wouldn't consider it to be possibly true no matter what. So for instance, two people could have the same recurring dreams of being a scribe in ancient Egypt. And one might say, oh, that's cool. I keep having those neat dreams. And someone else might say, oh, cool. I keep having those neat dreams. Maybe I was. Because if you don't think something's possible, you're not going to interpret uh, the data in all likelihood in that way, no matter what the, the experience is. So it seemed to me that being elevated in magical ideation would be a necessary precondition for interpreting some sort of unusual or weird experience whether it's something that happened to a person like a deja vu or the person went looking for, like maybe going through a past life regression, that you're just not going to consider that a possibility if you were low on magical ideation. So consistent with that theory and also similar to uh, Sue Clancy's participants, uh, my, my participants in the past life memory group were indeed significantly higher than my controls for magical ideation. But I see that as sort of like, that's the ticket you need to ride. And to be clear, although you do see elevated magical ideation uh, in, among people of psychosis, you also see it among very creative people as well. And it isn't always wrong. I don't want to give you the idea that magic ideation is never right. It's usually wrong, but not always. So for instance, imagine we were having a discussion about some sort of horrible play going around, say, a thousand years ago. Now, and you said to me, well, I think it's these little things that fly through the air that we can't see that like go in our mouths and our noses that make us sick. And I would have looked at you and said, that's crazy talk. We all know that it's if your humors are out of whack or if it's, uh, or if it's being, you know, it's God's will and you're being cursed, right? Right, so it's all relative to culture. Doesn't mean, you know, that said, Let's keep going, but I can answer questions. So, so far what the findings tell us is that rich imagination may lead to difficulty distinguishing a record of a perception from a record of imagination and belief in unusual modes of causation may be a necessary precondition for interpreting an unusual experience as a past life memory. All right, so here's the big set of studies. So I, I recruited 75 participants here. So I had 40 people with past life memory this time, a lot more than 15. And again, you can look at this later, but what's really striking here is that the IQs ended up, I used the Wonderlick, same thing that the uh, NFL uses. I used the Wonderlick to measure uh, in IQ and uh, they matched very they were on the nose for how much education the groups had had. And as it happened for IQ, the means, the ranges were slightly different, but the means were the same. And a 120 is what you would about expect for people who have a college education. It's about one standard deviation above the norm. It's a very bright group. And because I matched the groups, I've got bright participants in both groups. You with me? Okay. All right. So I was really interested in personality psychopathology because I kept getting asked about personality psychopathology. Like, isn't it that they're all a little, and I'm like, no, I don't think that's the explanation, but I'm willing to test it. I got asked about general personality traits and actually, no, I was interested in general personality traits. It was really the psychopathology I kept getting asked about, but personality traits generally interested me. I thought there might be something there that was worth considering. Creativity. It seemed to me this might be a creative way to deal with some really challenging questions. And I started wondering what the benefits might be. So this is a lollipop uh, 
chart. And this is just here so you get an idea this time of, well, how many past lives did people think they'd had in this, this larger group? So um, each participant's a lollipop, and you can see how many past lives the person thought she or he had memories from right there. So the highest being in the 20s and the lowest being one. That just gives you a sense that what the, what the groups looked like. So first question is having past life memory associated with personality psychopathology, psychopathology being mental illness or dysfunction. And the answer is no. <laughs> so I used a measure developed by Leanna Clark, the SNAP, which people do, if you're ever doing research, uh, have lots of yummy candy out if you're going to make people do this. I, I think it's the only way I got people through. Um, but it's a long measure. It takes a while. It's lots of questions, but it's well validated. So in terms of uh, these groups, you'll see they look like they're right on top of each other. And this is a little tiny print. I'm going to read this to you so you know what I'm talking about. So um, people who uh, the groups do not look different on measures of paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, schizotypal personality disorder, any social uh, personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, narcissistic, avoidant, dependent, obsessive compulsive, passive aggressive, sadistic, or self-defeating. They do not look different on any of these. And I think that's really striking. So it's not to say that people who have uh, past life memory are immune from having any of these things. It's simply to say they don't have it at any higher or lower rate than people in the general population. They just don't look any different. So it does not appear to be related at all to personality disorder. But what about other personality traits? So here we go. So this, these are from SNAP as well. And these Again, they're on top of each other for pretty much everything except for two, and I'll explain those in a moment. So in terms of mistrust, negative temperament, manipulativeness, aggression, self-harm, self-esteem, low self-esteem, suicide proneness, a whole bunch of these, they just don't look different. Um, but there are two where they do, and let me show you where they are. So one of them is in propriety. So that's really caring about what other people think. Again and again, I heard from my participants when I interviewed them about ways in which they'd experienced uh, or had to, uh, negative effects or had to hide what their, what their memory beliefs were. So I had one participant who told me that she'd lost out on being able to be a babysitter anymore when people found out she had past life memory because they thought she was crazy. Uh, I had a participant who was very afraid to tell her mother-in-law because she thought she would be excluded from the family if she did. So here's the thing. I don't think this propriety finding would generalize, but here's what I think explains it. If you're willing to come in and talk with a stranger about something that people might make fun of you for or treat you differently for, you might need to care a little less with the, than the average Jane or Joe about what other people think. So I think that my participants were being rather brave coming in, right? So they didn't, or, or at least they just didn't care as much what other people thought. So yeah, I can't really speak to bravery, but I can speak to propriety because I have that. It's that they didn't, they didn't care as much as the average person about what other people thought. And my control participants weren't, weren't doing interviews with me. They didn't have that piece of it. They did everything but the interview. Um, they weren't worried about something that they maybe potentially weren't comfortable talking about. So they didn't need to be lower in propriety in order to be willing to come and talk with me. Is everyone with me? Does that make sense? Okay, and the other place that there's a difference is eccentric perceptions. And that makes sense because if, if someone's interpreting some sort of weird experience in a spiritual way, you know, that's part of what this might be explaining, right? So um, strange bodily sensations, weird deja vus, it, it would make sense to me that they would be higher in eccentric perceptions and specifically on maybe interpreting eccentric perceptions in a spiritual way. But in terms of all of the other ways that they were measured on this particular uh, uh, measure, a whole bunch of things, they didn't look different at all. And I did do a Bonferroni correction if anybody is interested in the statistics. So I, I promise these are real differences. So that leads me. Ooh, I could have told you, well, if I get to it, I'll tell you. If, 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 if anybody's interested, I'll answer questions at the end. So big question I had. It seemed to me it was really creative to generate these memories and to uh, to deal with 
real world problems, often existential questions, and what seemed to me a rather creative way, like maybe mainstream religion didn't hold for, for some of these people, for example, as a possibility. So it seemed to me it might require extra creativity. And so I measured creativity. I looked at the creative personality scale. Um, these are the measures actually that Dr. Carson advised me to use. Uh, the divergent I used divergent thinking tasks and I used a creative achievement questionnaire, which is Shelley Carson, Professor Carson's measure. It's a really excellent measure too. So uh, do people know what a divergent thinking task is? What time is that? Yeah, well, I would say 15 minutes. 15? Okay, so I think we can do this. Do you want to do, do an abbreviated version one just for fun? Okay, so grab a piece of paper, or if you need to, you can type it, it's fine. And you can have fun with this. So what I want you to do, there's several different kinds, but I'm, I'm gonna give you just a little taste of doing this. Normally we do this three minutes timed, et cetera, et cetera, but I'm just gonna give you a taste of it. So for the first one, I want you to write down everything that you can think of that is edible, that is white. Go. Okay, I give you a chance to jot some down. All right, so go ahead if you want, put in chat what you thought was like the most fun one you came up with. I'll take a peek. Yeah. Oh, nut flour, interesting. Okay, snow, yeah, garlic. So you, you, the way you score these, these are great ones. Um, whoops, the way you score these, let's close the chat, there we go. Chat, trying to close the chat. Oh, yep, macadamia nuts, yep, okay. I'm just gonna, no, I'm, it's just slightly different than on mine. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Oh, it was hidden, it was underneath, okay. Sorry, <laughs> okay, so that gives me a taste of, of this. So what you, what you find when you score these is one, you score how many people have. So the more the merrier, the more answers. You also look at people changing categories. So imagine I wrote, fettuccine, and then I wrote elbow macaroni, and then I wrote spaghetti, and then I wrote angel hair. So this would all be answers, but I'm not changing categories. Whereas if I went nut flour, and then I said fettuccine, and then I said milk, and then I said coconut, and then I said snow, and then I went, you know, had a different dairy product. So you score for how many times people change categories, you score for how many answers they have, and you also score for uniqueness. So if, an, uh, if you're scoring a bunch of people, um, you know, maybe only one person in the whole group has daikon, then you give points for daikon. Does that make sense? Just as, a, just as an example. Um, all right, so let's see what I got. Is that kind of fun? And there are different ones. So that's, there's also ones for unusual uses, uh, ones for consequences. Divergent thinking tasks are really fascinating. Okay, so what about the, the personality scale, which is how people describe themselves? So the people with past life memory describe themselves in terms that are similar to other people who uh, are in creative fields, for instance. And yes, they are statistically significantly more likely to use words associated with being creative and not use words not associated with being creative. What about those divergent thinking tasks? So these are Z-scored if you're wondering, how do we have something below zero? So these are Z-scored. And if you look, my participants in the past life memory group were statistically significantly um, 
more likely to be giving creative answers. They had higher scores in terms of uh, their total scores, as well as individually for number of answers, number of category changes, and, um, and, and uniqueness. They just had higher scores all around. And I will have you know that those were scored by someone uh, that Dr. Carson trained and the person who had the data was blind to the condition of each participant. So they didn't, so the person scoring it did not know um, to try to avoid any bias and, and answers being ruled in and out. So it was not me who did the scoring. Uh, what about that creative achievement questionnaire? Well, there I've only got trending, right? You could you could say maybe because it's sitting there that 0.10. Um, and I'm gonna just really quickly show you that I think I had a bimodal group here, but the participants in the past life memory group, and you have to know that people who are scoring like 30 and up are quite creative people. So I had a lot more, uh, the, the ultra, ultra creatives were all in the past lifer group and the groups to me look a little different, but it has a relatively small sample. And I think there's something subtle going on here. The other issue is that creative achievement requires more than creative ability. It also requires, um, you know, sometimes like the supports of things of like somebody taking you for the piano lessons or those sorts of things. So I, I didn't necessarily think there would be differences on on those sorts of supports. But honestly, I'd love to look at this again with a larger sample someday. Maybe it's there, maybe it's not, I don't know. But certainly on the behavioral measure of creativity, which are the divergent thinking tasks, it was definitely there. So um, it may be that the same mental processes that lead to false memory can also in some circumstances be beneficial and foster creativity. Um, and again, this was consistent with thinking a past life memory is a creative explanation for an anomalous experience or is a creative answer for universal existential questions. So, well, and then the question is why sustain a belief in this? People are telling me that they're you know, losing babysitting jobs over this, why sustain belief in this? And I started to think that it might be uh, because there's some advantages here. So one of them, is, uh, oh, I'm skipping this. So are these people more spiritual than the average Jane and Joe? I looked at the, using the Delaney spirituality scale, uh, participants in the past life memory group were indeed more spiritual. They weren't necessarily more religious, but they were more spiritual than the average Jane or Joe also. Um, and in terms of personality boundaries, so the sense of separation between self and other, uh, higher scores, meaning less of a sense of separation between health and self and other, this isn't the best, image of it, but it turned out that the participants in the past life memory group were more likely to think that they feel less of a separation between themselves and others, which makes sense if they could think they could be someone else. If you feel less of a separation between yourself and other people, it's more likely to think you could be someone else. All right. And those are the breakdown for those. But this, here we go. This is where I thought I was about to land. So I went to uh, some events. I went to training for Brian Weiss that, that Brian Weiss ran at the Omega Institute. I also went to a conference for people who thought they'd recovered memories of past lives. And while I was there, I had a, it was really lovely. And I met this man, Jeffrey Keen. He has a, a book out and he has two books out now, but he, uh, he had had the experience of thinking that he had been General John B. Gordon. So Jeffrey Keen is a retired uh, fire chief, New England fire chief, but John B. Gordon was a, was, was a Confederate general. And I'm almost done. <laughs> so uh, in Jeff's, Jeffrey's book, he wrote, I left the two best observations for last. They're simple and need not be delved into at great length. No one ever dies, at least not in the way many people perceive death here on earth and love lasts forever. And I thought to myself, that if I thought that no one ever really dies, at least not in the way we see it here on earth, and that love goes on forever, and that I were going to be part of the unfolding of the universe over the millennia, not just the short blink of an eye that's my, my lifespan, I might find life even more meaningful. And I might be less afraid of death. And so it seemed to me that those might be maintaining factors. It might not be how people arrived at having past life memory, it might be those other things, but it might be why people continue to sit there despite uh, being recipients of prejudice. So what did I find? So I used measures. I used the reasons for death fear scale, the death anxiety scale, and the death depression scale revised. 
And what did I find? So I found that uh, relative to people, look at that teeny tiny p value and that medium sized uh, effect size. Oh, medium, yeah. So um, I found that relative to people who thought uh, they, they only, you know, they did not have memories from past life, people who thought they had memories from past life uh, found less reason to fear their own mortality. Uh, they also similarly were less anxious about their own mortality and they were less depressed by the prospect of their own mortality. But what about meaning in life? So there's a meaning in life questionnaire. The meaning in life questionnaire has two uh, aspects to it. One of it's a searching for meaning in life. The other is presence of meaning in life. So I didn't have any hypothesis about searching for meaning, but rather about presence of meaning in life. So um, searching, the groups don't look different. See that, that R value is small, that P value is large, doesn't. But what about presence of meaning in life? Well, there, there's something. So relative to people who did not believe that they had memories from past lives, people thought they had memories from past lives, uh, reported finding life much more meaningful. So just to recap, this is uh, a good portion, but not all of what I learned about people who thought they'd recovered memories of past lives um, while I was a graduate student, but here it goes. High false memory propensity, high absorption, which is that rich imaginative experience, high magical ideation, not linked to psychopathology, high in eccentric perceptions, low in propriety. But again, I don't know that that low in propriety would generalize. And that high false memory propensity is there, but um, here we go. High creativity, high spirituality, thin personality boundaries. So not so much of a sense of separation among other things between self and other. Lower death distress, greater meaning in life, and no differences in true memory recall in the tasks. So I want to thank you for listening uh, and giving me a chance to talk about something I'm very excited about. I want to thank my participants who are wonderful. My advisor, Professor McNally, um, Dr. Carson and Dr. Fersh, both of whom you may take classes with, were on my committee. And I thank them along with uh, Dr. Jason Elias, Professor Jill Hooley, uh, Susan Clancy's work, work I talked about, um, Ryan Bogdan, Dave Gallo, members of the McNally Lab, my amazing, wonderful research assistants from when I was a graduate student, uh, the, the Sackler Scholarship, the Stimson Fund, and the Hodgson Fund, which paid for all of this. And uh, thank you. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. I have a, a quick question. Um, I'm wondering if any of the participants were skeptics, uh, so where they didn't want to accept that they had experienced a past life, but felt they needed to because it was so strong? No, no I don't think so. I mean, I mean, I, I don't know that I specifically pulled for that, but no, but I'm not sure that those would have been the people who would have come in for the study anyhow. So no, no, I, I, I know. <laughs> um, Ekaterina. Ah, yes, I have a question. So I am a skeptic, but apparently high on creativity and um, the suggestibility. But the one thing that I came across um, is uh, uh, epigenetics. That is quite interesting because um, one of the experiments that they did is um, with rats that were able to inherit uh, learning experiences from their parents. Um, um, and I send it in the chat also. It is uh, something that researchers noted for a long time, um, but eventually they were able to um, prove it. So they, um, they exposed male rats to uh, cherry, uh, cherry uh, smell. And then they uh, did classical conditioning uh, learning with an electric shock. So the father rats learned to fear, uh, to associate this smell with fear. And then when they had offspring, eventually, those offspring, uh, when exposed to the cherry odor, they exhibited uh, fear, even though they were never um, exposed to this um, smell before, they never had it paired with, um, with shock. So it was very interesting how that um, uh, it, epigenetics is a recent addition to our scientific understanding of how 
things are passed on. So it was very interesting to me. But the only thing that is different with um, with this kind of um, experiences is that people usually report that their past lives are from completely unrelated people that may be like genetically very far away versus the other ones. It was directly from their ancestors. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. So a couple of things. So for anyone who doesn't know what epigenetics is, I'm not familiar with the study that you cited. I haven't read it, so I can't speak to whether or not I, I, I can't speak to its methodology or whether or not I think it's good or bad because I haven't read that particular study. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it without having read it, but I can at least tell a little bit about what epigenetics is because not everybody's going to know. So um, epigenetics is more or less punctuating your genetics. So epi means above and genetics are, are your genetic code. And so certain experiences can change how our genetic uh, code expresses. So uh, this is relatively recent. It used to be considered somewhat pseudoscientific as a, as a point of view, but it's a relatively uh, recent to be, you know, maybe seventies or something before some of the studies. So the way we uh, learned about it in the first place, as I recall, is longevity studies where uh, looking at people who had either been subjected to famine uh, in adolescence or not, and those who had been subjected to famine, this is like way up in Sweden above like the Arctic circle, this one little remote town that kept great records. It turned out that their, I guess these guys' grandsons lived longer right? I, there was some changing in expression. There've been some other studies, things like, um, <sighs> there's some with, I mean, I'm trying to think which ones have actually replicated because that's a little, that one, that's, that one's obviously we can't do a test on like that. But the notion, and there seems to be support for it, is that certain experiences can change how genes express. I don't think that that speaks to having, uh, I mean, the way we understand memory is that memories are, are, are in our brains. And your brain, your they're they're stored in your brain, and we don't have a mechanism in science for how a memory stored in one brain would go to another brain. Now, is it possible um, that people who are under a great deal of stress while pregnant, for example, like a lot of stress hormones, that that will maybe affect you know how anxiety prone the baby is? There there are certainly things that can um, that can be transmitted that aren't necessarily the genes, right? Uh, but we don't have any mechanism to explain how a, how a memory, uh, a specific memory would be. Now, in terms of, of preference on smells, I don't know. I haven't looked at the article. I wish I could give you a better answer. So I'm looking forward to looking at the article, but I haven't done it yet. So that's my unsatisfactory answer. Okay. All right, and uh, Calliope, you have a question. Yeah, hello. You um, mentioned the unusual uh, physical sensations during the presentation, and uh, you said if we want to know more about it, so please, if you have time. So this is this is where I was so amazed by my participants. So I had one participant. Um, I'll change a couple details so I don't accidentally give the person's identity away. But uh, this person, she had always, always wanted to go and see this, you know, this particular we're going we're going a tour of uh, Europe, see all the castles. Really excited for this. Uh, goes, takes this long awaited for, long saved up for trip. Gets there, gets on the bus tour, is going on the tour, and gets to this castle that she's in particular excited to go to. And she gets there. And she, she feels this profound feeling of sadness, like this deep, deep sadness. And why, you know, why, why sadness? And she sits outside for a while, can't, can't quite get herself to go in. And then finally it's like, okay, I'm, I'm here. I don't want to miss doing on a tour, goes in to the dark, you know, castle to tours through tours through tours through and there's a part where they come out and they're on the ramparts so they're out there they come out into the sun and the moment they come out she feels the pain terribly sharp in her eye as if she'd been pierced with an arrow in the eye and she thought I understand this I felt so terribly sad here because I died here in the past and that pain is how I died I was shot by an arrow defending the castle. That's how I died. That explains this experience. Now, would you like to hear my explanation of it? And I really like this participant, but I have a very different interpretation. So my interpretation of this event is a uh, person's probably not aware, but a lot of times with migraine, there's a prodrome. 
So before migraine, the pain actually hits. A lot of people, not all people, but a lot of people with migraines are, um, have this intense feeling of depression or sadness before the symptoms start. And then the symptoms start. And boy, did that sound like migraine. As a migraine sufferer, that sounded like migraine to me. Um, I'll say in defense of my participant, migraines are also associated with creativity. <laughs> It's true. Um, high IQ. There's some nice associations. Yeah. But um, no wonder I have a migraine sometimes. Yeah. But, um, but my interpretation is that this is a person who'd never had a migraine before, was jet lagged, probably a little sleep deprived, maybe hopped up on caffeine, maybe not, don't know, don't know at all, but whatever, or maybe didn't get their coffee, no idea about the caffeine part of it. But I can say sleep was dysregulated, jet lagged on a bus, strange place. My, my interpretation of this would be like, oh my goodness, how pooey, I've waited years to come here and now I have a wretched migraine while I'm here, bummer. Instead, my participant said, I have this terrible pain, it must mean this, and had this beautiful spiritual experience instead. So, yeah, right? I thought she was awesome. Um, Dr. Cynthia Myers, we're- You're out of time. Yes, thank <laughs> you so much. Sure. Um, can you quickly tell um, the participants where they can take class with you, how, what, seats, what, do you, what is your next class that has seats available? Because I'm sure they're selling out quick. Hey, so, um, thank you. So I'm going to be teaching uh, clinical psychology over the summer. Uh, and next year I'm going to be teaching, we're finalizing everything for sure, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to be teaching a class on grief. I'm going to be teaching class on motivation. I'm currently teaching a class on pseudoscience. I'm likely to teach that again. I'm not sure exactly when. I'm probably going to be teaching a uh, a little bit of debate definitely going to be teaching those so i'm i'm i also teach uh i mean I, i'm always teaching it seems like so i'm putting together a couple of classes which i promise i will announce to you the moment they are confirmed amazing and we'll also of course share it with all of our students so thank you for having me thank you so much and uh we'll see you next time bye, bye everybody